Hello, thanks for having me. I'm here today to show you how the lessons we learned from partnership working during Ebola can help us better manage the global health crises of tomorrow. First off, I just want to say that I love infectious disease. Now, I know that might sound a little strange, and a lot of people recoil away when, when I tell them what I do, but let me try and convince you. <coughs> infectious diseases affect all age groups, all walks of life, but in particular, you can help the poorest and the most dispossessed. There are effective treatments, and people can turn the corner from being deathly ill to fully recovered or controlled. And also, largely, we know how to control or at least limit the spread of these diseases through vaccination or public health interventions. Therefore, as a clinician, it's one of the few specialties where I can have a direct, immediate impact on the families and the patients themselves. Ebola, for as long as I can remember, the most legendary, terrifying disease has been vivid in our imagination. Now, as you'll see, a lot of what it turns out we thought we knew about Ebola was incorrect, but its deadly terror was true. I learned this firsthand when I was working in an Ebola holding unit in Connaught Hospital, Freetown, Sierra Leone's main referral and teaching hospital. It was a week in November 2014, a week I will never forget, where I cared for two young children, a brother and sister, orphaned, the rest of their family dead from the disease. My local and international colleagues and I cared for them dressed like this, our faces fully covered with masks and visors, our bodies fully covered in white Tyvek suits. The girl was about 11, the boy six. She knew they were both unwell, but wanted to protect her brother and knew we were there to help. She kept pushing away the food, the water, the rehydration fluid until we had cared for him first. The next day she was the same attentive sister, but they were both much more unwell. Him bleeding from his mouth and now nearly unrisable, her bleeding from her genital tract. But still she wanted us to treat him first, her little brother, her only surviving family. The next day they were both dead, lying head to toe in a hospital bed that would be their last. It's their deaths, among so many countless others, and why I'm so passionate to make sure we learn the lessons now to prevent this in the future. I want to share with you a story of how an international cooperation and partnership can help in terms of preventing future tragedy and how we can work with colleagues in some of the poorest countries in the world in order to make sure we save more lives faster. Now, Ebola has lived long in vivid imagination, conjuring up images of germ warfare and Hollywood blockbusters. But before the 2014 outbreak, it had affected relatively few people. In the four decades since its discovery in Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo, it had infected about 2,400 people with about 1,500 deaths. As you can see, in the subsequent years, there were sporadic outbreaks, limiting less than 500 cases each. Ebola was thought to be a tropical, exotic infection that was confined to small self-limiting outbreaks in rural Central Africa. It was thought to be a frightening, but ultimately unsuccessful virus, killing off its hosts too quickly to transmit to many others. To us in the UK, it felt distant, remote. The West African outbreak forever changed this. It was a black swan event, an inevitable consequence we did not foresee. There was no reason to think that Ebola wouldn't sweep rapidly through the populous towns in West Africa. No reason to believe that it wouldn't go to the big major capital cities. To show you what happened, we need to rescale things dramatically. This is the previous biggest outbreak, and as you can see, West Africa dwarfs that. By the end of the outbreak earlier this year, some 30,000 people had been infected, and over 11,000 people are known to have died. But it could have been much worse. The predictions at the time suggested that there could be many thousands of people affected each and every day, and that by January 2015, <coughs> there might be 1.4 million that had contracted the disease. Now, what actually happened is that small dot in the center and the larger circle, what could have happened? Now, this didn't come to pass, but I'll come back to this. First, I want to tell you a little bit about Sierra Leone. It's a small and beautiful country on the tip of West Africa, home to six million people and roughly the size of Wales. Before 2014, it was already tragically short of healthcare professionals, with approximately 150 doctors and over 1,000 nurses in the entire country. Now, to put that into perspective, surrounding us today, there are several central London teaching hospitals that each have many thousands of staff, each many hundreds of the most highly trained professionals, doctors. Now, to put that in further into context, I want you to think that 100 of these dedicated, brave Sierra Leoneans, including many leaders of the medical and nursing profession, died in the service of treating their fellow man. 
I think back to Madope Cole, who was only one of three consultant physicians in Connaught Hospital. Martin Salia, the country's only trauma surgeon. Sheikh Khan, the country's only infectious disease physician. These were our friends and colleagues who we worked and trained alongside, dead like so many others. Now within the context of both the scale of the outbreak and the staffing levels, I want to take you back to Connaught Hospital, an imposing building on the water's edge in the centre of Freetown. To the left is the screening booth. Everyone, be it staff, patient, visitor or relative, gets screened on entry for fever, symptoms suggestive of Ebola or links with known cases. If there's any concern whatsoever they are infected, they are taken into our Ebola holding unit for care and testing. This is vital to keep the hospital open because the other diseases that already exist do not abate during an outbreak. If we think of caesarean sections, emergency surgeries, ongoing medical conditions like tuberculosis and HIV, and acute medical emergencies like stroke and heart failure, all still need to be treated. But now to the right, this new structure that we built, as case numbers rose exponentially, and people would bring their loved ones and relatives outside the hospital awaiting treatment. We would go into that structure each and every day, not knowing how many cases there would be and having to decide who to bring in for testing. Ideally, this would be everyone, but as numbers rose each and every day, we had to make some terribly difficult decisions. <coughs> Imagine what you would do. Who would you bring in? Is it the dying, knowing that they're the most infectious? Is it the infants, knowing they're the most vulnerable? Is it the elderly grandmother, knowing that without her, the other children may have no one to look after them because the parents have died. Just think, who would you bring in? What would you decide? And the thing is, we know what to do to stop Ebola. It's what stopped all the other outbreaks before. It's rapidly identifying and isolating cases. It's following up their close contacts and engaging with local communities. And it's through robust infection prevention and control measures and where necessary, safe burial. These measures work. We know they do. They are the stalwart of infectious disease control and we use them every day. The key here was scale. What to do with Ebola at an unprecedented level. Now that is where partnership organizations such as King Sierra Leone Partnership can play such a vital role. King's is an example of the UK's fostering of international health links where we twin our academic and our health bodies with overseas partners. In this case, King's health partners within the UK and three key Sierra Leonean institutions, Connaught Hospital, COMAS, which is the country's only medical and pharmacy school, and the Sierra Leone Ministry of Health and Sanitation. We'd had an in-country presence since January 2013 and had built strong key relationships with leaders in the government and in the major hospitals. It was through these relationships that we were able to implement and support resilient, affordable, and integrated programs that are aligned to key Sierra Leonean needs. Through this, we're able to enact permanent positive change such as the local manufacturer of oxygen that's now supplied to our intensive care unit. I want to show you how the presence of our small international partnership was pivotal in helping drive and scale a local response. <coughs> because we were there working on the ground, we had colleagues and friends that we wanted to stay and help. But moreover, we were trusted partners, trusted to help work with these local colleagues in scaling up such a response. Together, we spearheaded the rapid establishment of our Ebola holding units, initially at Connaught Hospital, and then in five other units in the western area, the peninsula that surrounds Freetown. Now this is a graph, and in green at the top, the line is the total number of cases rising exponentially. The bottom green line, the number of deaths. Our units are the ones that are listed in red. And as you can see, they were there initially at the start, including when there was no other facilities avail available and when the international response was not yet felt on the ground. There are many key things about this model. Number one, by January 2015, when there was dire predictions were, we had looked after 14% of all confirmed Ebola cases in Sierra Leone and nearly 40% of those in the Western area. These units were cost effective. They had a total bill cost of less than $50,000 and a running cost of one million pounds over the 18 months of our response. To put that into context, that is less than 1% of the UK's total investment in Ebola. They were fast, that we were there early in the response and we could respond to need. At one time in three weeks, we opened up 60 beds. They were safe. They kept healthcare workers within the unit and outside safe and they kept the hospitals open. And they were sustainable because we trained up local healthcare workers to take over. Now these units don't work in isolation. The people that test negative receive general care in the wards, but those with Ebola need onward referral to dedicated Ebola treatment centers, which was another key component of the UK's comprehensive response. 
But we were there early. We were able to be the eyes and ears of that initial UK response. And we were able to help resources and attention to what our local partners needed. The units themselves were built within Ministry of Sanitation buildings, either in adjacent structures that were newly constructed, or here, like Connaught, where we repurposed existing buildings. Now, because of this, it meant that the time from construction to seeing first patient was very rapid, no more than one week. The ministry had overall leadership. They provided the units, the staffing, the resources, the supplies. Kings were there to provide training, unit design, care protocol pathways, and to troubleshoot where necessary. And the units we jointly built and the staff we jointly trained are now able to be there as a resilient method going forward for future outbreaks. Connaught's Ebola holding unit is now a functioning emergency department, but we have a newly built unit adjacent to the hospital, ready with trained staff for any future infectious disease if and when the need should arise. I want to show you this, this photo of three of our, our brave young staff, three young student nurses who worked with us. Due to the stigma in treating Ebola, they sadly had to leave their homes and live together in cramped accommodation. When one unfortunately got infected, all three did. Through prompt diagnosis and then excellent care they received in the UK's Ministry of Defence's Ebola Treatment Centre, they all survived. They survived, but so many did not. And in honour of the memory of our deceased colleagues and to provide a resilient and effective healthcare structure going forward, we need to maintain our commitment to Sierra Leone and our investment in its dedicated workforce. Because we learnt three key lessons during Ebola. Number one is that having a robust, effective healthcare structure and system in place is the cornerstone of any response. But we need to invest in getting the basics right now before any emergency at all levels of care. Number two, we showed that using local government is not only a safe and central way of acting in a, in a humanitarian emergency, but it is the fastest and most efficient way of doing so. And number three, we show that international partnerships such as ours can work together directly with our government facilities, work in close collaboration during an outbreak based on pre-existing strategic aims and partnership, rapidly shifting from a development to a humanitarian response. I regularly go back to Sierra Leone to cement the relationships that underpin our partnership model. This is a view I love. It's from the back of Connaught Hospital. As Ebola settles and fades in the memory, we know that this country, rich in beauty, resilient, enterprising people, will be able to face whatever the future holds, as long as we do not forget. When I think back to those children that died and all the people that were affected by the outbreak, I reflect how fortunate I am to work in an environment where I have resources, I have diagnostics, I have therapeutic options, I have a comprehensive public health system to work within. Days like that, where I watch young orphan children die together, simply do not happen. Days like that live long in the memory. And we know going forward that there will be future infectious disease outbreaks, future humanitarian emergencies, but it is within our power to ensure they are acted on quickly and effectively. That's where we believe the role of health partnerships is key and shows a model for how the UK and other developed nations can provide a groundwork for developing such a scalable local response, whatever the need, be it an infectious disease outbreak or an earthquake, a hurricane or a tsunami. Because we know that using local government partners being front and foremost of any response works. It is the role of the international community to get behind them and to support them. To do that, we need to lay the framework today for the health partnerships of tomorrow because we cannot let the countries most at need be faced with this situation again. And finally, I want to reflect back to those terrifying numbers, those predictions that didn't come true. I think we were lucky. The key question is, have we learned our lessons? To not do so would be a severe injustice to those children's memory. Thank you very much indeed.